must say I'm, I'm over the moon that they used a picture from 15 years ago. That's, uh, I was looking at that and so who's that guy? I recognize him. 20 kilos lighter, one marriage down. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was last actually at the MBS event in uh, Birmingham. Is anyone here in 2020? Birmingham? Two guys at the back. Oh, it was Mark. Of course you were there. So, yeah, I was, I was trying to explain in Birmingham the importance of embracing new approaches. And it's interesting to see what's happened in, the, in the, the construction world in the last 36 months and where things have been accelerated and where they haven't. And I think partly what it is is, is around how we think about change as a concept. And so as I was preparing for this talk, I thought I want to give a metaphor that you're unlikely to forget when you're thinking about how fast we need to be operating um, in, to, in the face of change. And so here's the metaphor. Here, here's how it goes. And you won't, you won't forget this in your life. In fact, you'll repeat it a few times to your friends. And it's, some, it's an idea virus. It's something that will live inside your head from now on. So I apologize for that. So I want you to imagine a football stadium, if you can possibly conjure one up. And you're strapped to the top of the seating in a seat that you can't move out of. And in the middle of the pitch, there's a tap. And that tap is a magic tap, because every minute, the drop of water that comes out of it doubles in size. So minute one, there's the equivalent of one drop. Minute two, there's two drops. Minute three, there's four drops. Minute four, there's eight drops. Minute five, there's 16 drops. I want you to think, how long would it take in minutes, hours, days, weeks, months for you to be underwater, strapped at the top of the stadium? Three days, two weeks. And what's amazing about this metaphor is that it explains what's actually happening in technology in terms of innovation speed. Because in this metaphor, minute 41, the grass is covered. Minute 43, the stadium's quarter full. Minute 44, the stadium is half full. And minute 45, the stadium is completely full. When the previous speaker around the sustainability part showed that curve, that crazy rising curve, that exponential curve, that's also the pace of change, specifically in technology. And today is the slowest pace of change we'll ever experience. And that magic tap in the middle of the football field is what's happening in tech. And the game has completely changed between my talk in Birmingham 2020 at the NBS event to now. And I want to mention a couple of the things that have happened. Bearing in mind that today is the slowest pace of change we'll ever experience. Even if we think Optimistically, we're at minute 41 when it comes to how revolutionary these new digital tools and technologies will be. We're only a minute away from minute 42 and 43 and 44. And what we tend to do is we think until we can visibly see it ourselves, the change isn't really happening. And that's most certainly not the case. So, <clears throat> of course, we have changes in technology, crazy changes in technology. But what that means is how we connect with things has fundamentally changed. How we can transact is fundamentally changing. And in fact, across the entire construction industry, my view is that our way of doing business has huge opportunities that we're, untapped, we're untapping. And it's like walking around a floor full of 50 pound notes and not picking them up. Even in terms of visualization, the amount of searches for building information modeling has grown by 246% in the last 10 years. In terms of image capture, the amount, the volume of aerial capture through drones has increased exponentially also, 239%. The changes in energy use is something, oh, are you taking pictures? Hold on, there you go. Which, that one or that one? 
Just bear with us. Hold on. Which, which one? Do you, which one? Not that one. I mean, they're all really relevant. Okay, not that one. This one. This one. Okay. Okay. All right. Can, can I carry you? All right. Okay. So yeah. Energy, energy use, we all know that there's entirely different formats of energy use, and also in production. I mean, what, in 2020, I, I showed a building, a, a 3D building in Dubai, and in, 19, in 2017, I showed one in China. That was it. And now we're starting to kind of realize that some of these technologies appear in our, in our more local regions as well. But then we also have automation and the changes in workflow that we can see and apply. By the way, at any stage, 90% of you will be thinking that this isn't relevant to you. If you're feeling that it's not relevant to you, you're, you're in the majority. That's the way that disruption tends to work. Most of the time, we think it's not relevant, we've got plenty of time, we're fast enough, we're wealthy enough, nothing's going to change as fast as you think. And that's the way that, that's the way that people normally operate. It's the reason why disruption tends to be disrupting. Disrepair is the Latin term to break apart. It's important that you, on a majority, don't agree with what you're seeing as relevant, because otherwise it won't disrupt you. It's, it's important that it disrupts. 10% of you, of course, will totally get this. Adopt loads of different thinking and win. But if 100% of you thought like that, then that's a whole different ball. That's, that's that's a terrible kind of competition. I only want to, play, I want to play in a competition where I've got a very strong chance of an unfair competitive advantage. So anyway, so we have changes in safety. I mean, it's interesting that we're, we're going to talk about this in the panel, hopefully, as well, is how modern technologies can actually impact safety, whether that's in terms of virtual reality, or whether it's an augmented reality, or wearables, or artificial intelligence. The opportunities for us to innovate, even some of the boring processes are profound. Anyone who's lived through the last three years will remember that the changes in the workplace have kind of now become embedded. So many people have, are aware that we don't necessarily all need to be in the same place. And also, the change in impact is quite strong. In terms of the impact of barriers to profitable growth in AEC, it's quite interesting. There is a strong correlation between the disaster of Grenfell and the product fragmentation in place, let alone the processes. What happens over time is that we become less responsive to change. But at the same time, the speed of change accelerates. That tends to be the case. And success, if I were to live again, and God forbid write another book, which will never happen, if I were to live again, it would only have one line in the book now. It would be a very short book. And it would be that success is about how well we change, and failure is about how much we don't. Ultimately, that's the learning. And I've helped 40% of the Fortune 500 companies. I helped IKEA grow from 40 to 50 billion turnover. I helped PayPal launch, Amazon, Google's strategy, their entire innovation approach. I've worked around the world in 116 cities, and ultimately, what it is about is our ability to change rather than cash flow, rather than product set, rather even than anything else than the mindset of our people and the passion of our people. Success is about how well we change. But the problem is, when we start doing new stuff, it doesn't look very good. We do new stuff that's costly sometimes, although I'm encouraged by the sustainability side of things that actually debunks that view sometimes. But we do things that are red numbers, bracketed numbers on spreadsheets, and we're trying new innovation out, and we look at it and go, well, it's actually failing in comparison to the linear growth that we're having anyway. If we don't do anything, then we're just going to have this linear growth, we think. And so one of the problems with innovation is that it looks bad from the outset. And so I've looked deeply into what that looks like in terms of decision-making inside our businesses. And I got this lovely chart from the brilliantly entitled Association 
of insolvency and restructuring advisors, which is the most boring name of an association, but their Christmas party was crazy. Anyway, they gave me this chart, and it shows that 52% of the time when things go wrong, it's completely internal. Nothing happened externally. No change happened externally. It was a decision that happened internally, 52% of the time. 15% of the time, there was some form of external trigger, and 24% as a combination of both. Now, for those of you who don't like personal accountability, this is your bit. 8% was external beyond control, and 1% was bad luck. That means that 91% of the time, it's on us. Largely about how we decide. And almost always about how we decide on what's changing and what we're going to do about it. QED. Let me go down one level deeper into that. If we operate without a purpose, not understanding why we're doing what we're doing, even if we have the right people, even if we have the right products, and even if we have the right processes, if we don't have the right purpose that we truly resonate with, what happens is confusion. However, if we do have the right purpose, but we don't have the right people, even if we have the right product and the right processes, there's resistance. If we don't have the right products, even though we've got the right purpose and the right people and the right processes, we go insolvent. And if we don't have the right processes, we can have the best purpose, the best people, and the best product, and all you're going to have is a hell of a lot of frustration. If you put them all together, you have an empowerment mechanism. And ultimately, this is what I've learned. I mean, I'm reaching the end of my career now to some extent. And this is kind of like the gray-haired experience side of things where it's like, if I knew this, I mean, I've had 11 startups, three exits, four abject failures, which my therapist calls learning. This is what I now realize is the case. But ultimately, success is a really lousy teacher. It seduces us into thinking that we can't lose. But my favorite quote is that experience is the hardest kind of teacher because it gives us the test first and the lesson afterwards. Ain't that the case? So now what I'm going to do is just go into some mindsets of how we can be thinking differently about digital transformation, which, by the way, let's, we can ditch the term digital. It's just transformation. Actually, let's ditch the term transformation. It's survival. So let's think about how we think. Interestingly enough, we think about 70 to 80,000 thoughts per day, and 80% of those thoughts are the same as the day before. From a neurological perspective, we're living in a complete and utter hamster wheel. We don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. We're on a repeat spin cycle. But nonetheless, if we think about how we think, from a fixed mindset perspective, we avoid trying to avoid making mistakes. I'll never be that smart. I know best. This is good enough. I give up. Most people think like this. 90% of people, 88, 90% of people think like this. 10 or 12% of people think like this. Mistakes help me learn. Feedback is valuable. Is this my best work? I improve with practice. I won't give up. It's nice and glib to say, yeah, think about having a growth mindset. But no one really ever unpacks that as to what that then looks like, other than some kind of Americanized motivational BS. So I'm going to go through four examples of how we can think differently in this industry right now, so in three years' time, if I get invited back, I don't have to do what I'm gently doing now, which is you didn't really do anything in the last three years. But this here is what we're going to look at. The first, and this is specifically for your industries. I still think there is a giant amount of unnecessary bureaucracy, and I think there is a giant amount of really obvious things that we can change that will have a miraculous impact. One example, for instance, is insecurity, cybersecurity. We still have systems, systems that involve people's lives that are password protected 
with eight characters of which involve uppercase and lowercase letters, which means that it takes a whole two minutes to brute force attack. The innovation opportunities you have don't need to involve robots. The innovation opportunities you have with new tools can involve really boring stuff. Like how we can revolutionize <laughs> where our information is kept and how our information is safe. Mess finding is powerful. And there's a four-step process to mess finding. One. Start with the most simple mess that's blatantly obvious. Two, use existing tools to fix the mess. Three, keep the solutions ridiculously simple. And four, don't make more mess. The next mindset unpack is around comfort zone. Most people operate on the left-hand side of this chart because we're human and we like feeling comfortable. But according to the Harvard Business Review, 88% of innovation growth comes from disruptive new innovation outside the comfort zone. 12% comes from doing stuff that we've always done. So the question we have in our heads isn't about what digital tools is this guy trying to sell me? The question in our head is, how much do we want to grow? Third, what and how we measure matters. It's very important that we become really obsessive with what we're measuring, including things that we may just think are a, a kind of a, a natural bolt on. For instance, Measuring effort. If I ran a construction firm or an architectural firm or design firm or any kind of building work, I would be measuring the effort that my people put in. I would have an effort metric. I would see whether or not the people who I'm around have the willingness to try. But we tend to just look at numbers. We, we, we learned that. We went to school and we learned that the bottom line is the, is the thing. Cash is king. And of course it is if you want to remain solvent. It's just how you get that cash isn't going to just come from cash. It's largely going to come from the decision making of the people inside the business, 91% of the time. Statistically, the thing that's most important of all is how we think about change. And then a lot of us, and I'm one of these people throughout the whole of my business life, that prefers the top right-hand side of this chart to anything else on the chart. When we're thinking about new approaches, and maybe you thought of some today when you're listening to sustainability talks or whatever, you might be thinking about things maybe differently or even some of the technology stuff. Think about things and think, well, where's the facts? You're just telling me that this, these things are theoretically possible. What's the actual nuts and bolts black and red figures. And the truth of the matter is, is that the only way of getting to the fact is through prediction. But you can't get to prediction unless you experiment, and you can't get to experimentation without speculation. Therefore, my friends, I am here today to announce that the volume of facts is directly proportional to the volume of speculation. So speculation is no longer the dirty word. Speculating with new approaches is no longer foolish and risky. You know what is foolish and risky? The new version of ROI that I would like to implant in your heads. The new version of ROI is risk of inaction. In the olden days, when slow change happened, I got I miss those days. Do you remember that? Do you remember the 80s or 90s? You hear about some new tool, technology type competitor, and it's like, all right, you go on holiday, play a bit of golf, get married, get divorced, have two kids, get married again. Oh, sorry. And so you go through these cycles, and you can see the change. And now everything seems to just be crazy fast. It's 
It's like you turn on the news and there's this new thing. And that wasn't the last pandemic we're going to live through. And this isn't the last war with an inherent nuclear threat. All of the changes that we're living through at the moment are just a slow motion version of the next five to 10 years. The changes in the next five to 10 years will feel like the changes of the last 30 to 50 years. And I don't know about you, but that terrifies me. I don't want things to change. I love things to be the same. And I'm saying that having literally written the book on change, <laughs> right? So on the Sunday Times bestseller, Powered by Change, by me, is the biggest flag-waving, change-positive book in the world. And if I left here and my car wasn't there as planned to take me to this next event that I'm doing tonight, I'd be furious. I hate change. If I turn on my phone and it's out of battery, I hate it. And then I walk on stage and go, everyone needs to be change positive. It's crap, we're human. We hate change. But one of the things that we have to be okay with, I've now realized, is that in this unknown, non-factual place, the only thing we can do to mitigate the risk of not actually having a negative downside business performance is we need to be speculating. And I don't think we should be lighting big fires. We should be lighting lots of small fires. The problem with lighting big fires, taking huge multi-million pound bets on one new approach, is what Procter & Gamble then call the outcome of blamestorming. You light a big fire, it goes wrong, and then everyone walks around workshopping who's to blame. Blamestorming. When you light lots of small fires, then at least you can see what's going on. I don't know what the future holds, and I'm the global futurist. I've always said to futurists, if you're a futurist, buy a lottery ticket and tell me what happened. You know what I mean? So we don't know what's going to happen, but we should at least try some stuff. That's my view. And that actually is the, kind of the main point of the growth mindset. The real positive winners... The companies that absolutely change the entire game have these left-hand side thoughts all the time. But 90% of people will stay on the right. And so one of the things that I kind of started to kind of <coughs> think is useful is to profile the people that I'm around, because I help companies grow quite a lot. I advise companies throughout the world. And I always see things in a kind of a grid. Imagine a two by two grid. We've got will and no will, skill and no skill. All right? So you've got will, no will, skill, no skill. And that means there's a two by two grid. So we've got four boxes. On one hand, we've got people with no will and no skill that is a problem. <laughs> So that's an issue. If we're around people with no will and no skill, it's really complicated. And I'm trying not to swear. So that's an issue. <laughs> and then we have people who don't necessarily have the skill, but they do have the will. And those people should be put in a position to learn. If they have the will but not the skill, they have to have the permission to learn. And then we have people who may not have the will, but they have the skill. And that's 73% of the population, according to the Gartner Employee Engagement Survey of 2022. 73% of the population in a workforce have the skill. It's can't be bothered. They could do so much, but it's just like, oh, it's much easier to just phone it in. In that employment engagement survey report, how it's actually identified, which is one of my favorite quotes of any research report, is that those people are either unengaged or proactively disengaged. Now, <coughs> proactively disengaged means these people are actually making an effort to not be engaged. It's like, it's a fundamental function of how they operate is to not be engaged. And I've seen it. I walked on stage, no one, does anyone here have anything to do with the mobile network three? 
Okay, there's this mobile net. Oh, okay. There's this mobile network that shall remain unnamed. <laughs> if you hadn't put your hand up, sir, you <laughs> mobile network that shall remain. And I come on stage, and the chief technology officer says, "Ladies and gentlemen, John McDonald, global futurist, best-selling author, blah blah blah." And by the way, everything he says, we're not going to do anything about. Anyway, not Jonathan McDonald. Proactively disengage. Or, for, okay, does anyone here have any affiliation with Vodafone? Oh, God. Okay. So a mobile network will remain unnamed. <laughs> I said to him, there's eight years left of runway when you, when you start making losses because of Wi-Fi prevalence, blah, blah, blah. And he said, I know the ship is sinking, but at least it's my ship. Anyway. My point is that when we have people with, with will <laughs> and no skill, they can learn. When we have people with no will and no skill, skill they should leave. When we have people with the, will, with, the, with the will and the skill, they need to be put in the position to lead. If you're in a firm and you're not given the permission to lead and you have the will and the skill, you should leave and find a firm who will give you the permission to lead if you so desire to lead. Just because you've got the winner of skill, you might not necessarily want to lead, but at least be given the opportunity to do so. And ultimately, the point is, it's about the will to either test, learn, and improve, or it's about the will to lead. And if you have the will to succeed, succeed you will. It's extremely important to think of things in this way. I invite you to take a picture of this link. You can add me on LinkedIn. You can send me emails. I can help your business completely spank your competitors if you so desire. It's up to you. I don't mind. Go for it. I'm your competitor's best weapon, if you don't. <laughs> but my key point is this. As we move into the panel with the fabulous guests we have, and we're talking about things that may still be seen as less relevant. You'll see someone from an AI firm and think, oh, God, not more about AI. Think, what is it that I could take from this that we could experiment with? Think about that. You're going to see someone from a large consulting firm. And consulting firms typically have a reputation of stealing your watch and selling you the time. But don't think of it in that way. I want you to think about it in terms of how can this experience from McKinsey enable me to accelerate? Drop the bias. And when you hear from the NBS perspective, this is an example of how everyone can actually learn from each other collaboratively. If you want to move fast, move alone. If you want to move far, move together. And I wish you all the very best of luck. Thank you. <laughs>